Oh hello, welcome to another video. In today's video, we're going to be looking at everything that we could learn from the Night Lords vs Mandrake's Kill Team Battle Report that was on Wire Plus last week. So, I really enjoyed the Battle Report, and I want to say straight off that if you want to go and have, like, I think it's 40 minutes or so, of people really celebrating the game of Warhammer, go and watch the Battle Report for the entertainment value. This is just my summary to stop people who are like me that really just want to extract the most value from the, the rules that are previewed um, and try to collate this all in a meaningful way. So, let's get started. So, the Night Lords. Um, the Night Lords are a six-man team. They have access to Seek and Destroy. We learned that. We don't know what their other archetype is yet. Um, in the battle report, we saw the leader and um, the uh, four... I've written three, which is wrong. The four new interesting specialists, and a single gunner with a, a flamer. Um, now, just to go back to the um, the preview that we saw, what seems like a very long time ago now, uh, we know from the preview images, I've, I've put them down below, we've seen a plasma gun, right? So we can assume that the gunner has all three of the options that are going to be on the sprue, the flamer, the plasma, and the melter gun. Okay, we also have seen a a, a missile launcher. Um, so we assume that you're going to have the choice of a heavy gunner. Um, it would be, I think, reasonable to assume that they're going to have access to the heavy bolter as well, because remember that's on the basic Chaos Space Marine sprue. Remember that they're not going to have access to the the auto the chain gun because that was exclusive to the Legionaries Kill Team upgrade sprue, which isn't going to be included in this set. You also see in the Warhammer previews that they have access to the generic icon. Um, the, the guy in the middle here at the bottom with the little icon on top of his uh, backpack. Um, but again, that's not featured in the battle report. So you've got six options here, but there's going to be some more options. Gunner, heavy gunner. Um, but it's good that they showed off all the unique specialists. Obviously, they want to show up as much cool stuff about the team um, and not have, you know, a... a, a a really powerful but boring piece like a plasma gun really dominate the game right it needs the the heroes of the narrative of the game needed to be the new guys right so i understand why they've done that right because they're not they don't play battle reports to win they they play battle reports to set up uh cool interactions and cool moments that showcase the new stuff and plasma guns being awesome isn't new uh, so these are all the things we learned about the Night Lords that, generically. I think we must have almost all of the... Um, it feels like almost all of the strategic ploys. So we're going to go through the strategic ploys first. So we got Prey Sight. Um, until the end of the turning point, when determining line of sight for each friendly Nemesis Claw operative, enemy operatives within red are treated as having an engage order unless they're in cover from enemy terrain. So if you're within red of somebody... Um, you know, you, you, you can shoot them um, even if they're in cover and on, on, and on conceal. Now, this team, as we're going to see, hasn't got that much shooting. It does have a plasma pistol on the leader, okay? Um, and then, of course, we can take that gunner. I'm thinking, like, for a lot of reasons, I think that... I know everyone's like, oh, the plasma gun's the best gun, you'd always take it, but the Night Lords do seem to have a lot of synergy with the, the Melter Gun, right? I mean, the Melter Gun is better than a plasma gun at short range, right? Because you don't have to run the risk of getting hot. Um, and against some armies like Intercession and, um, you know, Custodes, you're not guaranteed to one-hit kill with a, uh, a plasma. You probably will one-hit kill more likely with a Melter Gun, though. Um... And the addition of this option that only works within red, like, it doesn't make the melter gun better because obviously it still applies to the plasma gun. But I kind of feel like taking a melter gun with the team will force you to play, to bring everyone up and play more aggressively with them, which will give you better habits. Does that make sense? Whereas as soon as you have a plasma gun... Um, it's tempting to try and park him behind a thing and, and like, use him to, to at long range, and then you're not really playing to the strengths of the Night Lords. Now, all that having been said, um, obviously a third of the time you're going to be on loot, and something that is frustrating, I and mean, this is a close combat team, right? Something that is frustrating is when you're a close combat team and you're playing loot, and it's like, well, now I've got to have a guy that hangs, you know, you're going to have, at least, depending on the, 
exact map, you're going to have at least one objective near your home territory, then you're like, well, I need to have a guy that loots this every turn. So maybe then you take a plasma gun. Or maybe then that's when you're taking a heavy gunner, you know, and have your heavy gunner guy stand at the back and go, cool, I'm going to be the back line. Don't know. But this is a cool ability. There are some teams where this will be utterly broken, right? But because by and large, like, there's not that much shooting, you know, I mean, yeah, you take a gunner and a heavy gunner, and, you know, it's quite, it's fair, it's, it's three good shooty pieces with the leader. Uh, we don't know how good the heavy gunners are going to be, because we don't know if, um, if they're going to have access to, uh, not stabilizers, whatever it's called, what you, the equipment that you can buy for a heavy weapon that takes away the heavy rule unless you move with it, right, which could be a big deal. If you can get that equipment piece, that could be a really big deal, um, so we'll see. Uh, the next um, strategic ploy, we've come for you. Until the end of the turning point, each time a friendly nemesis claw operative is activated, if the first action it performs during the activation is the charge action, after it finishes the action, you can select one enemy operative within engagement range to suffer D3 mortal wounds. So this is a big deal. Um, so straight away you're going to think of, well, if I've got a weapon that hits, that's got a crit of a 6 or a crit of a 7, then you can hit wound thresholds um, and run and get that one-shot kill. But even beyond that, you're thinking about, like, well, you know, if... And I'm not the best kill team player, but I try with combats to be thinking in terms of the multiples of wounds that the enemy has. So, you know, how's the combat going to go? I'm going to get, you know, am I looking to get a crit and then a hit? So I'm going to get a crit, tank one dice of damage and then hit, and then he's dead. And just having that extra couple of wounds can just really affect that maths in certain circumstances with certain weapons against certain enemies. And it's a combat team, and it's one CP, and it's for the whole team, so you don't have to telegraph exactly what you're planning to do. I think that's really good. I think that's a really good ploy. I think you're going to try and use that in TP2, TP3. Yeah, uh, most, most, most games, right? Uh, Nightmare Manifest. So, for one CP... Um, Friendly Nemesis Claw Operatives can perform two fight actions during their observation or two shoot actions during their activation if a bolt weapon is selected for at least one of those shooting attacks. A bolt weapon is a ranged weapon that includes the word bolt in its name, e.g. bolt gun, heavy bolter, etc. Now, you're not going to have that many bolt. In fact, unless you... I mean, I imagine if you decide to take the basic icon bearer, he can have a bolter. And I'm sure you can take a basic warrior with a bolter. But if you're taking your fantasy operatives... You're not going to have any bolters. Now, you have got that heavy gunner option, and there's um, a conversation to be had around there between the heavy bolter and the missile launcher. If you're going to take a heavy gunner, obviously the fact that this exists, maybe it's a reason to consider the heavy bolter, because you're going to be playing it. You're going to be playing Nightmare, Ma Nightmare Manifest anyway, because it's got your fight action, your, your two fight actions in there, which is... Against some teams, going to be absolutely vital for you to shoot, to charge and then fight twice, just because you they got a lot of wounds to to chug through. Um, so maybe that's a reason to consider the heavy bolter, especially if the heavy bolter gets equipment that lets you move and shoot with it, and the missile launcher doesn't. This we don't know because the, the one thing they've shown very little of is the equipment list. But I think it's nice. I think they've realised that if they I gave it split that out into two separate ploys, so it was a CP for double fight and a CP for double shoot. Nobody will be taking the double shoot, right? And the last uh, tactical ploy that we a uh, sort of strategic ploy, uh, I forgot. Yeah, the last strategic ploy that we saw was the Black Hunt. Until the end of the turning point, each time a friendly nemesis clock operative fights in combat with or makes a shooting attack against an enemy operative that has less than its starting number of wounds remaining at the start of that combat or shooting attack in the roll attack dice step of that combat or shooting attack, you can re-roll one of your attack dice. I think this is pretty niche. Um, yeah, I can see it coming in turning point three, um, but it's one CP to get a re-roll in combat where at the start of the combat they're already um, wounded. Bearing in mind that you can spend one CP for a command reroll anyway, you need to be looking at the board state and going, I think this turn there's going to be at least two combats um, where I'm going to be in a combat or make a shooting attack, to be fair, against an enemy operative that has less than its starting number of wounds. You need to have done... Maybe you're playing against someone like Custodes, 
uh, intercession and you've done some chip damage in turning point two and you're in turning point three and you're thinking, okay, I've got a lot of their models are injured, then it can be worthwhile. But unless you've got that board state where a lot of their models are in, don't do it just because you've got one combat. Because if you've got one combat where you can see, well, I'm going to charge him and he's already lost wound, um, like... <sighs> Although, although, hang on, uh -huh. uh, here's a thing, it does synergize, does it not, with, um, we have come for you, right, <sighs> yeah, sorry, so if you charge, it's your charge action, right, you finish the charge action, you suffer d3 mortal wounds, because you've been charged, and then you launch into the um the start of the combat attack right in in the yeah so yeah no that's what they've done okay i take it back you you play this in turning point two don't you when you've got your two or three charges and you buy both of them because then if you're getting two or three charges going in you're gonna get to um cause a wound at least one wound with we've come for you and then you're gonna get your re-rolls and so then it's probably more worth doing yeah, that's quite cool. Okay, I, I, I wonder if it's supposed to work that way, but it certainly looks like it does work that way. We've got some strategic ploys, some tactical ploys. I always mix those words up. So some tactical ploys. Uh, proclivity for murder for 1 CP. Uh, if you incapacitate an enemy operative in engagement range, you can immediately perform a free charge up to blue or a free dash, even if you've already performed an action during the activation that prevents it from performing the charge or the dash. So... If you've got Nightmare Manifest up so you can fight twice, that certainly allows you to charge, fight, do a free charge up to blue, and fight again. So if you can see at the start of the, the, start of the turn, hey, there's uh, two enemy people within charge range of my one guy and within within blue of each other, then you go, yep, yeah, Nightmare Manifest, and then you spend... Pro it's, it's 2 CP, but you potentially kill two guys, you know, if you're fighting against something a bit weaker. Um... You potentially kill two guys with one activation, which is exactly what you need to be doing as a six-man team, right? Vox Scream. So Vox Scream has the one plus CP thing going on. So um, it's funny because the CP cost is generally redundant in the game. It, when Compendium came out, some abilities cost two CP. Uh, but Vox Scream, uh, this is now the only time they use the CP. It's one plus CP. So in the se second time you use it, it costs two. Third time you use it, it would cost three. And the fourth time that you would use it would cost... Um, four, yeah. So you use it when your opponent would activate an enemy operative, and you just say no, you you can't activate that operative in this activation. Um, which is interesting. So obviously you can't do it if they've got no one else left. Um, but it does mean a lot of the time if you have a board state where it was really important for someone to get the first turn. Because somebody's definitely getting the jump on the other person, and you don't get the first turn, but you can then say, "Oh, you can't activate that guy, right?" So it can be really, but it's not one of those things that you're going to plan for. You're not going to have some elaborate plan like, "I go here, I do this, I go here, I do this, and then I do this." But it's one of those things, like like all the best tactical ploys. It's one of those things that you have to keep in your brain, right? And this is the hard one of the hard parts to kill. Through. You've got to keep all your tactical ploys in your brain, and then be like, right, oh yeah, this is the moment where I can do that. The, the The board state has occurred that means I can now do this thing, and it's just having the mental agility. And this is a place where I sometimes struggle with the kill team. It's having the mental agility to have all of your tactical ploys, like in your in your mind at all times, right? And then go, aha, it's time for this. Um, out of the darkness. So use this tactical ploy at the end of the scouting step. So this is one of the interesting ones where... Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. In the chat? No, I'm not live. In the comments. Um, technically, you could use this four times, right? Because this is what we decided as a community, that if, if something's happening at the end of the scouting step, uh, you can like use it over and over again if you want to. Um, no, I'm not saying that you would. But basically... It lets one of your models move up to two circle as though it had fly, which is, like, really good in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I'm thinking of better decimal would be really good, especially when we, we, we combine that with something we're going to see in a second, okay? Um, 
if you've put a barricade down, or even if you, yeah, uh, you know, that that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Powerful ability. Then we saw two pieces of equipment, right, uh, only. So, Flayed Skin can't be combined with Grizzly Trophy. The operative gains the following ability for the battle. While this operative is visible to within blue of an enemy operative, your opponent cannot re-roll attack or defense dice to the enemy operative. That's pretty cool. And Grizzly Trophy, I think it's one we've seen before from Legionaries, right? So while the operative is visible to within blue of an enemy operative, subtract one from the attack characteristic of the enemy operative's ranged and melee weapons. I think Grizzly Trophy is better, but that's then why it's 3 EP and not 2. It's really hard to talk about how good equipment is in a vacuum because you have 10 points and you know what you want to spend it on and there are some things that could look good on their own and then you'd never take them um, because of other things that you really want to take. But Grizzly Trophy is certainly a good thing. Flayed Skin, more more, more situational. You have to, you know, but it's still useful depending on what else is there, right? Now, the team-wide special rule is called In Midnight Clad. Night Lords are one with the darkness, employing it as an ally and a weapon. When determining if a friendly Nemesis Claw operative is an enemy operative's line of sight, that friendly operative is obscured if all of the following are true. So it has a conceal order. It's within black of heavy or light terrain and or any part of its bases underneath the vantage point, And it's more than red from enemy operatives it's visible to. So a lot of people have been saying, as internet shorthand, like, oh, um, Night Lords have super conceal, which is kind of... Right. Super Conceal is not a rules team, a rules term. It doesn't exist in the Kill Team rulebook. It's kind of a community invented term, but it usually applies to, like, if you think about Compendium Gene Stealers, I think were the first team to have Super Conceal, right? And, and Super Conceal, when people generally use that term, just refers to the fact that if you're on a Conceal order, people can't uh, treat you as if you're on an Engage order by any rule, including being on a vantage point. Um, this is different, and it's stronger, and it's weaker. So, why is it stronger? Well, it's stronger because um, you have to be within an inch of heavy or light terrain. So, you, someone could have, um, someone could have uh, unobscured, unobstructed, total line of sight to you, but if you were uh, 0.9 of an inch, away, you know, in front of a barricade. Uh, on a conceal, and they were further away than red from you, then you would be obscured to them, despite obviously not being anything there to obscure you, because the idea is that you're in this hiding in the shadow that's being cast by the barricade. So you can move a little bit further forward. So if you think about it in terms of um, in terms of like uh, um, if you had, oh, let's think about. Um, out of the darkness, right? So it lets you do a two-circle normal move. So if you've placed down a barricade, um, normally you'd want to end behind the barricade, the move behind the barricade on conceal. You could actually end like a, almost an inch in front of the barricade on conceal, and then you'd still be hidden by the barricade. But then in your next turn, if you want to charge, you haven't got to traverse the barricade. Do you know? So that's quite, like, that's actually quite good, because it means that you can place your barricade and you can think, okay, I'm going to do a two-circle fly to in front of this barricade, right? And I'll be on conceal, and I'll be in midnight clad, and then I'll be able to move to this other place or that other place and do this other thing, and I won't have to lose a circle's movement. So maybe that lets you get right up the board. To, obviously, you can't charge because you're in conceal, but maybe it lets you right up the board to, to hold an objective or just get into a really good position for turning point two for a really good charge maybe a really good charge that's using uh productivity for murder to knock off two enemies or something like that so really quite powerful ability but the reason it's a little ner a little worse i think than super conceal um is that there are more and more weapons now you know the crew sniper rifle the kazakin all specs um most of a phobos team if they build that way um there's more and more things putting in the game. And I think it's becoming one of the key, like, stock. Like, we, we know what a medic is. We know what a gunner is. We know what a voxcaster is. And I think very soon we'll be very much going, yeah, we know what an all specs guy is who removes obscuring, right? I think they're handing out more and more guys that have remove obscuring. Um, and as, I'm not sure when this is going up relative to my balanced data slate video, but if you've read the balanced data slate, you know that they've taken obscuring away 
from Better Decimate, they turn that into not visible precisely because of the number of these removes obscuring kind of characters they put into the game. So the fact that it is obscuring means that depending like on some matchups, if you're playing against a team that doesn't have an operative that can remove obscuring, it's just better than Super Conceal, right? But if you're playing against Phobos, it's much, much worse. <laughs> Um, and if you're playing against one of these teams that are more normal, that have one guy that can maybe remove conceal, then it's like, well, it's 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 definitely a side grade, right? And then we saw one of the three faction tack ops, Dread Tail Dark Rumor. Um, if a friendly nemesis claw operative is within red of your opponent's kill zone edge, you score one VB. Must be at the end of the battle. And if a friendly nemesis claw operative is within red of an enemy operative, you score one VP. Um, I'm not sure. This could be really used to score. Uh, I often end up, even when I win, I end up sort of with one model left or having been tabled, but then having gotten enough momentum with my secondaries and primaries. It feels a bit to me like if I've got a guy who's in your drop, like, then within red of your opponent's kill zone edge, is, yeah, hmm. It feels like it's something that you might do most of the time, but also it feels like it's quite hard to engineer, right? Especially, I play against Zimbad a lot, and he, like, always plays very aggressively with a lot of teams. So how, you know, how are you going to guarantee that your opponent has an operative that's within... Well, I suppose it can be two separate operatives, right? So you can have one operative within red of an enemy operative anywhere, one VP, one operative within uh, red of the opponents. Is that, yeah. So if you're not tabled, you're probably scoring at least one, unless you've tabled them. You have to also kind of go, oh, I, mm, I don't know. I think it might be quite an easy one. It just depends on what you end up wanting to do. They've otherwise got Seek and Destroy. I mean, it lets you not take Headhunter, because most people won't let you score two VP from Headhunter. Uh, so you could just take like Robin Ransack and Route and this. Might oh, I mean, be what I go for. Yeah, maybe. But we they got the other two, right? Let's get into what we've seen about the. Um, yeah, sorry about. That. Let's get into what we've seen about the particular characters. So what I've done is I've tried to collate all the because it, in the battle report it all comes through in a really random order. So this is the leader, the Night Lord Visionary. He has an Astram and Chain Blades. That's five attacks hitting on two, four, five damage with rending. So rending Chain Blade, uh, and he has a plasma pistol. Where well, we didn't see the stats of plasma pistol, but I'm going to assume it's going to be a plasma pistol. It's on twos now. Plasma pistol is on twos. Do not to sniff at right. If we know he generally is a guy that hits on twos, um, that's always good. Uh, we can't rule out that he's going to have other weapon options because obviously the Chaos Space Marine kit comes with power weapons. But frankly, if it's trading your Chain Blade for a power weapon at the cost of changing your Plasma Pistol for a Bolt Pistol, no one's going to do that. It's pretty irrelevant. Um, so, kit does come with a Power Fist as well. <sighs> if you can take a Power Weapon and a Plasma Pistol, or a Power Fist and a Plasma Pistol, maybe you'll do that. But maybe they're just going to say you have to take this loadout, right? Because we want you to use the cool Skellyman chainsaw. And why not, right? Uh, if I was GW, I'd certainly make it. So, oh yeah, technically you can use all these other parts. But the, the Nostrum and Chainblade is the only one that can be paired with the Plasma Pistol. And then everyone's going to take the cool new thing, right? He has this big ability, Prescience. So... Once each strategy phase, when it's your turn to use a strategic deploy or pass, you can use this ability instead. If you do, you add D3 Prescience tokens to your pool, right? So it's a token generation ability. So for one AP, um, and it's a psychic action, which I'm sure Sisters of Silence do something with psychic actions, maybe Grey Knights, maybe Thousand Sons, I don't know. But uh, Premonition, uh, you discard one of your tokens, you gain a CP, and it's one AP. Right, and you can't do any engagement range. Um, so that's fine. You can get an extra CP every turn, which is good. I like teams that can get a bit more CP. And then you're left over. I think basically the way you're looking at this is you're going to try and get a CP most turns as long as you can spare the action point to do it, right? Because obviously he is also going to be one of somebody who, who, who comes up the table um, and, and shoots and stabs, you know? 
uh, and you got portent, portent. So once per turning point, when you fight in combat, so this is entirely selfish. When you fight in combat or a shooting attack is made against you, at the start of the result successful hit step of the combat or shooting attack, you can discard one of your tokens to discard one of your opponent's successful hits, which is really powerful. We need to keep you alive. Sorry. So that's purely a selfish one. And then you've got foreboding, so in the firefight phase, it's your turn to activate a ready-friendly operative, you can discard a pressing its token to skip the activation. Um, which is really cool if someone's got, you know, if someone's got like a plasma gun or a sniper that's covering a certain area, and they're going, well, this is an elite team, so I can just stand there and keep them pinned down. Maybe it's going to help you just get through their models, force them to move someone interesting somewhere. Potentially, but it's one of those things where you have six with the foreboding, you effectively have seven, but most teams still have more models than you if they had more models than you to begin with. So, yeah, you make them waste an activation, but probably they can keep their choices things till after you've activated all your models still. Now, we don't know if there's more uh, things on the menu for prescience than might well be. Um, I think... The leaders are an interesting thing. We've seen this before with other leaders where it's like, well, what do you do with him? Because on one hand, he's got a plasma pistol. He's got a pretty good combat weapon. Okay. He's got a pretty good ability to keep himself alive. Um, so you want to get him up there, get him stuck in with the enemy, plasmaing things, slapping things, and sorting things. On the other hand, there's a thing in the back of your mind that's like, well, if he dies, I'm losing a lot because I'm losing this 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 generation of points. I'm losing the ability to generate more CP. Um, you know, coupled with the popularity of Headhunter, meaning you always have to worry a bit about rushing forward with your leader. Um, so it's an interesting one. Maybe you keep him a little bit back and use him as a counterpunch. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I'm really yawny today. But there we go. I'll push through, push through, push through. So the fear monger, so the poison fella. So he's quite interesting. So for, first of all, let's go for his weapons. He has a Tainted Blade. Five attacks hit on threes. Three, five. Uh, terror Cam. So Terror Cam, each time you fight in combat or make a shooting attack with the weapon, in the resolve successful hit step of the shooting attack, the first time you resolve a crit, which is a strike, the enemy operative gains a Terror Cam token until the end of the battle. It doesn't already have one. And then we see that a Terror Cam, in the ready operative step of each initiative phase, enemy operatives with the Terror Cam token suffer D3 mortal wounds. Even if the operative has been even if this operative has been incapacitated, so it's quite cool that once your um, once your terror cam is on, there's no getting it off. D3 mortal wounds at the start of every turn. That's pretty cool. Um, you also got a scoped bolt pistol, so it's a bolt pistol, but it can be fired like a bolter. But if you fire it as a pistol. You've got lethal five up. It's not the most exciting weapon in the world, but it does give you a potential long range option if you need one. Uh, another thing we can see is the equipment. So, um, you know, the visionary had the grizzly trophy, which we've seen. The fearmonger had a chain snare. I didn't use the chain snare in the battle report, so we don't have the rules for it. Um, but we know we're getting something called a chain snare. Night Lord's Screecher. Uh, I'm sure there's more rules for him that we haven't seen. So he had a pair of lightning claws, um, you know, uh, five dice in on threes, four, five, lethal, five, relentless, which is pretty good. We also know he has the Screecher ability, so basically he's Howling Banshee. Uh, while it's within blue of an enemy operative, better than a Banshee. While he's within blue of an operative, you worsen his blitz skill and weapon skill, which is pretty cool. Um... He also has Appetite for Cruelty Feeds on Pain, so I don't know if there's some rule for him that's not been revealed. Maybe when he damages people, he can heal, would be my guess. Uh, but I think there's slightly more to him than we've seen. But honestly, he's just a, he's just th his real thing is, I have Lightning Claws. We also see the team's going to have access to a Crack Grenade, so that's good. Um, then the Skin Thief, uh, he has an Astram and Chain Blade. Uh, chain glaive, sorry, chain glaive. So it's five attacks in on threes, four, six. Reap one and rending. That's pretty good. Tyrant of the skinning pits. So when he fights in combat, you subtract one from the damage characteristics of the enemy's weapons, which makes him quite tanky, I suppose, which is good. Um, don't know if... I think that might be all his abilities. Uh... 
I don't know if he's going to have anything else to add on to that. Um, I think the Flavor Them Alive enjoys taking his time could be in reference to the Tyrant of the Skinning Pits, or it could be another special rule that wasn't used in the battle report. I don't know. Uh, but he seems like a powerful combat fella, right, in a lot of ways. Obviously, somebody's going to move with the maths and be like, oh, actually, you know, against this team and that team and this team and that team. He's not, but, like, he seems good. The Ventrilli Eurocar. So... This is an interesting one. He's got a bolt pistol. Um, for some reason, the bolt pistol hits on twos, according to Warhammer Community, uh, when they flash it up on the screen. So that's quite okay. And then he has this disconcerting mimicry. So one AP, it's a psychic action. Select one operative within red. You can select one of the following things for it to do. You can only do one thing per battle. So you can go, you've got minus one APL. You can change his order. Or you can perform a dash. Um... I think powerful, but like, unless it does a little bit more, if you're considering dropping somebody to get a heavy bolter or a missile launcher, I think this is going to be the guy that you drop, quite honestly, because as powerful as the abilities are, it's three abilities, you're going to each one once, and they're quite situational, you know? So let me know in the comments, and maybe I'm totally wrong, and he's brokenly good and everything else. But I think he's probably the weakest one, and he's the one that you might occasionally consider swapping out for a heavy gunner. So gunner, so gunner had a flamer. We've talked about flamers uh, and the fact that you could have had a plasma or a melter, and why they th I thought they'd do that. And it just as well confirmation that we're getting a combat blade. Uh, he didn't have any equipment. Yeah, we're getting a combat blade as well. So it looks like we're getting a lot of equipment that's shared with Chaos Space Marines with a couple of bits, like the flayed skin that's new. Right now on to the Mandrakes. So the Mandrakes are a nine model team, APL2. Uh, a leader, four specialists, and four basic warriors. So in contrast to um, the, the the Night Lords, this looks like it's going to be a basic one-box team with no variety. You're always going to run this list, is what I, I think is going to happen here. And I think it's really interesting that in, in a kill team, you can have as much flexibility in your list building as you would like. So you can buy a team like the Mandrakes here, or, you know, like the the, the, the Galafox or the Star Striders, um, Commandos, I think, as well, to an extent, right? Uh, and have, here's a box, here's my team, built it, I'm going to play it the same way every single time. You can have a team with a little bit of flexibility, like most Marine teams, where you maybe got one operative that you swap in and out, or you can go for one of the teams with insane flexibility, like Admech, um, Thousand Sons, right? Um... Inquisition, you know, where actually they run into the roster limit and rostering is a thing and tweaking your list and working out what to bring against each matchup is a thing. And you can pick what kind of experience you want. And that's pretty cool. And you can pick one kind and your opponent can pick another. And you can both have the amount of list building that you enjoy and it doesn't really impact the game. And I think that's a really cool thing about Kill Team. So, like, before someone's like, oh, I'm disappointed that, that this is only uh, going to be like a one box team with no options. Like, and that might disappoint you. But it, someone else might be thinking, yes, a one box team with no option options. Like, I can move on from my Felgos Ravagers that I loved because they were a one box team with no options. Like, I can just buy a team and build and play it and play it and not have to collect 20 models and worry about what's going on my roster and this, that, and the other. So, that's cool. Let's have a look at the the rules for Mandrix. So, uh, Mandrix um, revealed similar, no equipment revealed uh, that, at all, which was interesting. So, Mandrix. Um, they have this concept of within shadow. So an operative is within shadow of any of the following are true. It's within one inch of a heavy part of a terrain feature, and that part's not lower than it. Any part of its base is beneath a vantage point, or it's within an inch of a shadow portal token, which we'll learn about when we see the shadow weaver, right? And if you're in shadow, we'll go down to the very bottom here, where it says shadow passage for 1 AP. So it seems like all the Mandrakes have this as an action. If you're within shadow, you can do a free normal move action within it. But instead of moving, uh, you remove it from the kill zone and set it up again within shadow, but not within engagement range or line of sight or of enemy operatives. It can't make shooting attacks until the next turning point. So you can't shadow passage and then charge because it comes to your normal move you can't shadow passage and then shoot because it tells you you can't um so this is really good for repositioning because by the way you have access to recon and so many of the recon things are like go a place right and your guys will just go places i think you will just score recon and no one will be able to stop you um in most games but but 
it does mean that you've got very killy when you get there, right? Um, talking about recon, let's talk about the um, the Shadows Reach tactical ploy that we saw. So reveal this tack up in the target reveal step of any turning point. At the end of any turning point, a friendly Mandrake operative to control the terrain feature wholly within your opponent's territory with any parts of the heavy trait. You score a VP. If they achieve the first condition with a different terrain feature during uh, any subsequent turning points, you score one VP. Um, so you could take this and you could take Secure Vantage and you're doubling up. Right. If you wanted to. Now, if you're playing on Octarius, right, where, um, you know, you've got the, the, the barricades, or you're playing on Better Decima, where you've got, like, at least for one of the things, it's got a, um, the little built-in barricades, or you can place, no, hang on, ah, I'm wrong, because it has to be heavy terrain, within an inch of a heavy terrain feature, not lower than you. And those bits are usually light terrain, aren't they? Certainly a barricade is light terrain. I've never had to care before. Is the, is the battlement on an Octarius building heavy or light? Because I know that the, the it's literally never made a difference because you can't get a vantage point to it. But is it heavy or light? Because if it's heavy, then you can teleport on top of it with the shadow, and that's ridiculous. Um... Someone in the comments will tell me. I have a feeling it's coloured in light as a different colour for the for the for the battlement bit, the bit that sticks up. But yeah, even so, you can double up Shadow's Reach with a vantage point if you want to, or you obviously for Shadow's Reach rather than Vantage, certainly really easy to score within Shadow because you can just teleport to next to buildings and they control the buildings. And you really like if your opponent wants to deny you those secondaries, they're really getting snarled up in their own drop zone trying to trying to get you off their things and they're not advancing forwards with all their guys. Uh, so it's a really interesting combination of things, having all the shadow movement stuff and then also having recon and this tack up. That's quite interesting. Uh, Umbral Entities. They all have a 5-up save. When they're in shadow, they have 4-up and vulnerable save as well instead. Right, that's pretty cool. And then the other one that's a rule that comes up a lot and is really weird is Soul Strike. So they all have, or most of them have anyway, a ranged weapon with Soul Strike and then one of them has other things it does with Soul Strike. But I don't think they have any ranged weapons in the game that don't use Soul Strike. Basically, um, you can't use invulnerable saves against Mandrakes ever. They're irrelevant. They are fighting against your APL. So instead of say, rolling your defense dice using your armor save, you roll them and you discard anything higher than your APL, right? And a one is a critical save. So against APL three teams, right? Um, twos and threes are normal saves and ones are crit saves. And against APL two teams, a two is a normal save and one is a crit save, right? Um, which is pretty grim. It's pretty grim. I'm trying to think. There are, there are things in Compendium, uh, like Sisters of Battle and Sisters of Silence, where you can have Sisters of Silence and Inquisition teams as well. I don't think there are any really mainstream examples of things that have APL2, but like have a high armor costed in. You know, I've got a three-up save, and that's presumably part of what makes them balanced. But anything else like that that was like an APL 2 3 up save guy has been absolutely ruined by Soul Strike. Meanwhile, um, you know, if your APL, if you don't wear armor or you have a 6 up save or something, then you're laughing, right? Uh, okay. The ploys, the ploys, the ploys. So we got most again of the um, strategic ploys. So Blade in the Dark, until the end of the turning point, friendly Mandrake operatives that have a conceal order can perform a charge action if they start their own within shadow. That's pretty cool. Ask a commando player, yeah. Gloaming Shroud, until the end of a turning point, each time a shooting attack is made against a friendly Mandrake operative within shadow. In the roll defense dice step of the shooting attack, before rolling your defense dice, you can retain one normal save without rolling it, in addition to cover, if any. Right, so 
for one CP, all of your guys can retain a dice. Is that what that's saying? When you're shot, that's cool. And if you're in cover, you can retain two, which is really cool. Inescapable Nightmare for 1 CP. Until the end of the turning point, each time a friendly Mandrake operative within shadow fights on co in combat or makes shooting attack in the roll attack dice step of your combat shooting attack, you can re-roll an attack dice. Okay, so, yeah. 1 CP, re-roll combat. Again, you need to have multiple combats going to happen that turn because obviously it's not worth doing it if it's just the one combat because you can get your re-roll for 1 CP as and when you need it with command re-roll. Creeping Horror. Until the end of the turning point, after each enemy operative's activation, before the next operative is activated, you perform free dash with one friendly Mandrake with a conceal order. If it starts and ends in shadow, um, each friendly operative can only be set for this ploy once per turning point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Until the end of the turning point, after each enemy operative's activation, Every time they activate, you can randomly dash a guy. Huh. Interesting, yeah. And then we saw two tactical ploys. One CP. Use the tactical ploy at the end of any officer's activations. Let one friendly Mandrake that has an engage order and within shadow and flip back to conceal. Always good. And nowhere to hide. Use tactical ploy when a friendly Mandrake officer performs an action which it moves until the end of the activation. The operative can move through parts of train features if they were not there. Again. Pretty cool. Let's have a look at the characters. So we start with the. This isn't the leader, but we start with him anyway. Uh, the Shade Weaver. The Shade Weaver is really interesting. So the Shade Weaver, as far as I can tell, he has Bale Blast, which is the. This is basically the Mandrake Bolter. It's the basic ranged weapon they all have. If they're not noted as not having a ranged weapon, or they have a different ranged weapon. So four dice hitting on threes, three four damage, and that Soul Strike rule. So it's basically it's just a Bolter, but it's Soul Strike Bolter, so it's um, slightly better. Right. So the main thing that Mandrake Shade Weaver does is he opens a shadow portal. Right. So two AP. Notice two AP. Remove your shadow portal tokens of any. Perform a free shadow passage action with the operative. If you do so before and after it moves, place one of your shadow tokens within circle of the operative. Um. Now I'm really stupid because I don't understand the point of this. Right, because, hang on, okay, hang on, so, Shadow Passage, if an operative is within Shadow, perform a free normal move action, but instead of moving it, remove it from the kill zone, and set it back up again within Shadow, but not in engagement range or line of sight of enemy operatives, it can't make shooting attacks until the next turning point. And you're within shadow if you're within black of a heavy terrain part of the terrain feature that's not lower than it or any part of its base is underneath a vantage point or it's within black of a shadow portal token. Now, given that the shadow portal token is created by doing the shadow passage action, you must be in shadow already at the. At the so the places where you're placing the shadow portal. Um, are already in shadow, right? So, because when I first read this, like, if, if you read this rule in isolation within shadow, you have to either be within this or within this, but all of your shadow portal tokens will be within an inch of a heavy terrain feature, right, or underneath a vantage point, because you had to be within shadow when you placed it down. So this third bullet point seems pointless. So then what's the point of it? Well, let's see if this other ability tells us shadow portal. Any number of friendly Mandrake operatives can perform the shadow passage action each turning point. If they start that action within white of one of your shadow portal tokens and finish it within white of the other... Um, oh... Okay, I see. I'm with it now. Only one operative a turn can normally shadow passage, right? Yeah. So the shadow portal's point is making you ha allowing you to have multiple guys do that, right? Such as in the battle report, it was used to score. Um, you know, the thing where you have to get two guys within red of their deployment zone, uh, the recon tactical ploy, score that really simply. Yeah, okay, I'm with you now, I understand. 
Um, so you've also got Weave Darkness. Remove your Weave Darkness token, if any, and then place your Weave Darkness token in a location visible to this operative or on a vantage point of a terrain feature visible to the operative treat as an intended target for the purpose of visibility. The token creates an area of smoke. It's just infinite smoke grenades. Uh, yeah. Oh, so every turn you can throw a smoke grenade. That's cool. But you can't throw a smoke grenade and open a shadow portal because you've only got two AP. Ooh. Infinite smoke grenades is pretty good, though. Right, Mandrake Night Fiend. Um, he is the leader. And he looks like a generic guy. He's got two bones in his head. That's it. That's it. He does something harrowing whispers, which we didn't see in the battle report. Okay. All we saw from him, really, was this Oubliax ability and the profile for his Husk Blade. So Husk Blade's rancid. It's five dice, hitting on twos, two, uh, four, six, uh, lethal five up stun. So it's a stun, it's a stun five dice power weapon, right? That's pretty good. And... Oubliax, at the start of the turning point, or if the operative incapacitates the enemy operative with its husk blade, its Oubliax becomes active. At the start of each turning point, or if this operative in, in, incapacitates the enemy operative with its husk blade. So it's always active at the start of the turning point. So it starts active, right? Um, and then if you kill someone, you charge it up again. But yeah, while it's active, each time you an attack dice would inflict damage on the operative, you can roll d6 on a 5, ignore the damage inflicted from the attack dice, and it's no longer active. So it starts active at the start of the turning point. You have your 5 up to ignore a dice of damage, and then if you kill somebody, you can charge it up again. It's fine, but it's a 5 up. It's like... It's nice when it happens, but you can't really rely on it for anything. It's and then it's a lot of it's a lot of rules text for something that's just gonna occasionally come up and be like, oh yeah, that's cool. I don't know. Huh. Pretty uh, lackluster for a leader, but I think oh, really sorry, there must be more to him, right? There must be more to him. This is because the clock went back, and I'm just not had enough sleep, right? But there must be more to him than that. There must be something else that he does for his harrowing whispers that we haven't seen. Uh, Mandrake and Bissell. So the Mandrake Abyssal really is the one that plays with the Balefire stuff, um, the the Soul Strike stuff, all this, all this bits and pieces. So he has an action point for for first of all he has a better gun, right? So he has Bale Surge, which is like a big massive fireball rather than a little weedy one. So it's five dice hitting on threes, three four damage, and then depending on what you pick, you can either have Blast or Lethal Five Up. All right. He also has Wreath in Balefire. So one action point, you select an operative visible to you that doesn't have one of your Balefire tokens, and until they start their next activation, or they're until they're incapacitated, they gain a Balefire token. So what does a Balefire token do? Well, each time you make shoot the attack against an enemy operative with a Balefire token, uh, you add one to your damage, both your damage characteristics, okay? Um, and they have the no cover special rule, or if you've put it on a Mandrake... Um, every time a shooting attack is made against a friendly Mandrake that has a Balefire token, you subtract one from the damage characteristics of the operative's ranged weapons for that shooting attack. Cool. Um, Mandrake Chooser of the Flesh. So, he's got a big, he's got a Reap 2 weapon, he's got a Bale Blade, 4 dice hitting on 3, 5, 6, brutal. Lethal 5 up Reap 2. And if that wasn't specialised enough, he also has Soul Harvest. Each time an enemy operative is incapacitated as a result of this operative's part collector ability or Bale Blade. Don't know what part collector does on its own, right? That didn't come up. But presumably it's damage dealer. Um, including as well the Reap Special Rule, add one Soul Harvest token to your pool, or two if it's APL3 or more. Each time friendly Mandrake operative activated, you can spend one of your Soul Harvest tokens to add one to the operative's APL until the end of the battle. Or have it regain D6 lost wounds. 
You can spend Soul Harvest tokens even if this operator has been incapacitated. So he's just a melee beat stick, but then he goes around collecting these Soul Harvest tokens that you can spend to upgrade your team. So your opponent can't let this guy claim too many souls because otherwise they'll be fighting against two or three APL3 uh, models, which is pretty cool. It puts, the pre it puts a great big target on his head, um, but it puts the pressure on your opponent to really get rid of him, you know? Then we've got the, the Dirge Moor. So the Dirge Moor potentially has a different ranged weapon. Okay, so it's like a flamer, uh, but better. So it's five dice hitting on twos, two, two damage. Range red, indirect, soul strike, mortal wounds two and stun. That's pretty good. Okay, pretty good. He has a really interesting thing called hunting focus. So once each strategy phase, when it's your turn to use a ploy or a pass, use this ability instead. If you do so, select one enemy operative for this operative to focus on until the end of the turning point. When your opponent would activate that enemy operative, if this operative is ready, you can activate this operative first. If you do so during the activation, you cannot select any other enemy operatives as targets for combat or shooting attacks made by this operative while that enemy operative is in the kill zone. So you can go, you know, oh, your plasma gunner is my hunting focus. When they go, I activate my plasma gunner, you go, haha, I'm getting a double turn with my dirge more. Um, but you can then only do offensive stuff against their plasma gun. Because you could just use it to run off and go and capture an objective or do something else unrelated, right? But you can't use it to go and attack anybody else. Now, another rule that this guy has is Paradolic Projection. So select an enemy operative within shadow or in the operative line of sight, which is a nice touch. So any enemy operative in shadow anywhere. Until the start of the operative's next activation or until the operative is incapacitated, this operative is incapacitated, that enemy operative is treated as being injured regardless of any rules that say it cannot be injured. So the obvious play is you put this on somebody, this, 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 this hunting focus on somebody, and if they activate that hunting focus, if you, if that, that, that character, if you can see them or if they happen to be in, in shadow, you can jump in and go, my guy's going first and he's injuring you and then they have to activate the guy that they declared who's injured and maybe they can't do the things they wanted to do which is pretty cool um yeah and it's apl can't be positively modified the operative can't form the action engagement range of enemy operatives a pretty cool little utility utility piece with an interesting like flamer thing as well and then you take four billy basic mandrakes so they have the same Bail Blast ability that everybody else seems to have, the basic Fireball. They also have their Glimmer Steel Blade, which is four dice hitting on three, is four, five, lethal, five up, which is nice. And if they're within shadow, it becomes uh, four, six, which is pretty rough. Four, six, lethal, five up. That's Power Sword. That's four guys with Power Swords if they're in shadow. So potentially really cool, and you have four of them. And that's it, we're done. That's all the information that we learned from the Warhammer Plus video. So, uh, we know the bulk of the rules about these teams now. We didn't miss much. We, we, I think there are some nuances still to discover, especially the equipment lists. Hopefully, um, you know, once the pre-orders go up, we'll get the people, the influencers and things that are on GW's list and get advanced copies of stuff. They will start to get those advanced copies and then they will tell us the rest of the rules and we can make a fully informed decision review of everything they have but i think generally speaking we know most about what they do so my kind of uh hot takes i guess would be that the mandrakes have i think they have a really strong thing going with being able to score those recon tack ops of various kinds quite trivially with their movement shenanigans i think it's been really hard to stop a mandrake player from getting his secondaries so the question becomes is are they killy enough to actually do that and also dominate the primaries for sure it's a good thing and it makes them feel quite broken but you can't just say that's going to win them every game because you need to also score primaries so we'll see right they look quite strong though i like the night lords uh i think the night lords probably like you can't help but compare them with chaos legionaries because chaos legionaries let's think about it chaos legionaries you've got the same thing so you can have the same heavy gunner gunner and icon guy right that's fine and then you've got you've got the same the, the, the big thing chaos legionaries have got is they've got the librarian you don't have the librarian he is a powerful piece 
but maybe our combat guys are a bit better than the legionary combat guys. I think it's going to be really interesting. I think there's going to end up being one, because th- 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 never before have we had two teams that would be so comparable with each other in terms of both being six-man teams that could take a plasma gun, right, and they have power armor and do all these things, uh, and, and then otherwise have mostly combat guys. Like, it's very similar. Um, you know, big chain lave guy, big chain axe guy, stabby poison guy, you know... Interesting, but interesting. Let me your thoughts on that at the well, which down the bottom. Which do you think comes out on top? Legionaries or Night Lords, from what we know so far. I do want to say it's worth watching the original Battle Report on R Plus um, for entertainment value. Like, I know that I've talked for basically an hour breaking down the rules, but if you just want something to. Like, it's fantastic that we live in a world where you can go, hey, my niche hobby, and then there's this 40 minute immaculately produced, really fun, really entertaining piece of TV that you can just sit and have on. Uh, I had a chat actually with, with Nick Baton, uh, the, one of the players in, the, you know, uh, in Battle Report, who happens to be playing in a tournament, and we played a game against him. We were chatting about, like, I asked him, like, how many hours and stuff goes into making these things. It is a lot of time. Um, and I. <sighs> I don't feel bad about putting out this video because I don't think games work. I don't think games work. Like, there might be somebody in the senior um, corporate part of Games Workshop that's like, yeah, some people will tune up to Battle Report just to get the rules. And so, yes, I am stopping the person that was never going to enjoy the Battle Report for what it was and that was just there to extract the rules from enjoying the Battle Report. Well, I think, actually, the Battle Report's a really bad way to get the rules because they don't match them up and put them into a nice digest format like i've tried to do so but i think as a piece of entertainment i think it's really cool and you should consider going to watch it um obviously not everyone can afford one hour plus and, and whatever else but I, I that's my two pence there i want to say a big thank you to all my members especially nightfall and massive crit who are both subscribed at the highest tier thank you very much your uh, continued sort of support is very much appreciated I uh, hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope we're going to have some lively discussions, debates, predictions about where these teams are going to fall uh, down in the video uh, comments. All right, guys, thanks. Until next time, have a great rest of your day. Cheery, cheery, bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Awkward pause.